Time magazine called him the unsung hero behind the internet. CNN called him a father of the internet. President Bill Clinton called him one of the great minds of the information age. He has been voted history's greatest scientist of African descent. He is Philip M. Iguali. He's coming to Trinidad and Tobago to launch the 2008 Kwame Ture Lecture Series on Sunday, June 8th at the JFK Auditorium, UE St. Augustine, 5 p.m. The Emancipation Support Committee invites you to come and hear this inspirational mind address the theme, Crossing New Frontiers to Conquer Today's Challenges. This lecture is one you cannot afford to miss. Admission is free, so be there on Sunday, June 8th, 5 p.m. at the JFK Auditorium, UE St. Augustine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Philip Emma Aguale. The scientific discovery is the nothingness from which new knowledge sprang. That new knowledge makes the, dis the discoverer a messenger from God. For me, Philip Emma Aguale, my quest for the fastest supercomputer that can do one million things at once was a very difficult and a never-ending journey. My quest began on a sequential processing supercomputer that was at 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Covalis, Oregon, United States. My quest for the fastest supercomputer began on the morning of Thursday, June 20, 1974. Three weeks after I began that quest for the fastest supercomputer, the photo of a 19-year-old named Philip Emma Aguale appeared on the front page of an Oregonian American newspaper. Two years before I began that quest for the fastest supercomputer, the name Philip M. Aguale was mentioned in the science column of the Daily Times of Nigeria. For a half century, the Daily Times was Nigeria's only national newspaper. One year after the name Philip M. Aguale was mentioned in the Daily Times of Nigeria, I won a scholarship to the United States. On the 16th anniversary of when I began my quest for the fastest supercomputer, and on June 20, 1990, the Wall Street Journal reported that Philip M. Aguale has experimentally discovered how and why parallel processing makes computers faster and makes supercomputers fastest or discovered a new supercomputer. Since 1989, school children in the United States, United Kingdom, and Canada are asked to do a school report on the contributions of Philip M. Aguale to the development of the modern supercomputer. Back in 1989, it made the news headlines that a lone wolf African supercomputer wizard in the United States made an experimental discovery of how to solve 65,536 mathematical problems at once. That discovery is called Massively Parallel Processing. I experimentally discovered that the fastest arithmetical speeds in supercomputing can always be recorded with massively parallel processing technology and used to solve the largest scale 
problems in algebra. Those algebraic problems in turn arose from the most abstract problems in calculus. For the 16 years onward of June 20, 1974, I conducted my scientific and technological research as a lone wolf supercomputer programmer. I programmed supercomputers at the computer center at 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Corvallis, Oregon, United States. Each morning at 7 a.m., I parked my red two-speed bicycle in front of the nearby mathematics building that was named Kida Hall that was at 2000 Southwest Campus Way, Corvallis, Oregon. But I came to the public attention 16 years later and for my experimental discovery that occurred in Los Alamos, New Mexico, United States. Los Alamos is a small town that is the birthplace of the atomic bomb. But to research supercomputer scientists, Los Alamos is the capital of supercomputing. Let's put supercomputer simulation of nuclear explosions at Los Alamos in real world context. The first atomic bomb was detonated by the United States on August 9, 1945 over Hiroshima, Japan. The second atomic bomb was detonated three days later over Nagasaki, Japan. Following worldwide outcry to ban nuclear use and testing, the fastest supercomputer is used to quietly simulate the detonation of atomic bombs. Paradoxically, the simulated nuclear explosion is more real and has greater degrees of freedom and can be repeated again and again than the actual nuclear testing that is extremely limited. So, supercomputers are secret tools used to simulate nuclear explosions at a densely populated mega city and to evade the spirit of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. The Los Alamos National Laboratory in Los Alamos, New Mexico, United States was where I experimentally discovered how parallel processing becomes the computational engine that makes computers faster and makes supercomputers fastest. I experimentally discovered that parallel processing that makes the fastest computations could arise from the bowels of a primordial internet. Faster computers could arise from perhaps quantum computers that will solve traveling salesman problem. But in my opinion, the quantum computer will have limited use for its seemingly unlimited supercomputing speeds. That is, the quantum supercomputer could never be harnessed to solve any of the 20 grand challenge problems in supercomputing. The reason I experimentally invented parallel processing alone was that in the 1970s it was impossible for a black African supercomputer scientist to join an all-white supercomputing team 
such as the team in Los Alamos National Laboratory that was simulating nuclear explosions. As a black African supercomputer scientist, I felt like I was in exile wherever I was. I am in exile in the United States. I was in exile in Nigeria, Africa. I was in exile in the then uncharted territory of the massively parallel supercomputer. Algebra is the way the computer experienced calculus. Calculus is the way mathematics experienced physics. And physics is the way animals experience the universe. At the U.S. National Laboratories, operated by the Departments of Energy and NASA, each member of the large multidisciplinary supercomputing team brought his or her unique knowledge of physics or mathematics or computing to the team. A member could bring expertise from the frontier of knowledge of biology chem or chemistry or physics, such as her mastery of the laws of physics. Or a member could bring expertise from the frontier of knowledge of number theory or large-scale algebra or advanced calculus such as her mastery of the partial differential equations of calculus and her mastery of how to solve the larger system of equations of algebra or her mastery of how to assembly code the most computation intensive algebraic kernels or that member could bring her expertise from the frontier of knowledge of supercomputing such as his mastery of massively parallel processing. I mastered the parallel processing technology at the time. It was ahead of the times. I mastered parallel processing theoretically before I experimentally discovered it. To discover parallel processing required both theories and experiments. Because massively parallel processing was a grand challenge problem that transcends mathematics, experimentally discovering how to solve the most computation intensive problems in computational physics required both a polymath that is a jack of all sciences and not merely a mathematician that has expertise only in algebra or calculus. As the lone wolf research supercomputer scientist of the decades of the 1970s and 80s, I had to be a polymath or a jack of many sciences that sent and received two to power 16 emails to and from 16-bit long email addresses that were around an internet that I visualized as a global network of 16 times 2 to power 16 short, regular, and bidirectional email wires. That polymath had to be at the frontier of knowledge of physics and possess the command and the mastery of computational fluid dynamics. 
that polymath had to be at the frontiers of knowledge, of mathematics, and possess the command and the mastery of how to formulate and then solve the partial differential equations of calculus and how to code and parallel process the supercomputer solutions of the larger scale systems of equations of algebra. That polymath had to be at the frontier of knowledge, of supercomputing, and possess the command and the mastery of how to parallel process across an internet that is a global network of two raised to power 16 processors that were equal distances afar and apart. It took me 16 years of multidisciplinary training to be at the frontiers of that uncharted territory of knowledge. To arrive at the frontiers of knowledge of scientific and technological knowledge required that I attended 500 weekly research seminars and attend them during the decade of the 1970s and 80s. Each research seminar was given by a foremost research scientist that was at the frontier of science and technology. It took me 16 years to become that triple threat in physics, mathematics, and supercomputing. Most importantly, I had to be forward-looking and be way out in unfamiliar territory of the technology of parallel processing. I was the only research supercomputer scientist of the early 1980s that gave research lectures on how to harness massively parallel processing and use the technology to solve the toughest problems in computational physics. In the early 1980s, I was severally ridiculed and I was warned that I would fall through the cracks of parallel processing. When I announced that my experimental discovery of massively parallel processing, everybody warned that I had made a mistake, but everybody was mistaken. What kept me moving forward was a back of the envelope theoretical calculation on how to compress time to solution in large scale computational physics that I did in the 1970s. I mathematically discovered that processors that could only calculate 47,000 330 floating point arithmetical operations per second can be integrated across a small internet. I mathematically discovered that internet as a global network of 65,536 processors that are equal distances afar and apart. I mathematically discovered that internet to be faster than any supercomputer that computes less than 3.1 billion calculations per second. It was my experimental reconfirmation of my mathematical discoveries that made the cover stories in the world of mathematics, including the May 1990 issue of Siam News. The Siam News is the leading mathematics publication. That experimental discovery of how to solve a million or a billion mathematical problems and solve them at once and across as many processors became my contribution 
to mathematical knowledge. In the 1980s, I was the long wolf full-time programmer of the only massively parallel supercomputer that's an ensemble of 65,536 processors. It made the news headlines that I, Philip Ebangwale, discovered how to harness those computing units and harness them to compute simultaneously within 65,536 processors and compute together as one cohesive whole unit or massively communicate and compute in parallel. That is, in the 1970s and 80s, my technological quest was for massively parallel processing across an internet that is a supercomputer de facto. That is, I was searching for an actual parallel processing supercomputer while theorists were theorizing their way through a non-existent parallel processing supercomputer. A theory is not a discovery. A theory is an idea that is not positively true. In the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, parallel processing was ridiculed as a beautiful theory that lacked experimental confirmation. And you cannot experimentally discover the fastest speeds in supercomputing by merely and only theorizing about it. In 1989, I experimentally confirmed that massively parallel processing can enable the large-scale computational mathematical physicist to compress hard time to solution of the toughest problems in arithmetic, algebra, calculus, and physics, and to compress hard times to solution from 180 years to just one day. That the experimental discoveries in massively parallel processing that followed in the subsequent three decades was a series of cleanups and refinements and rediscoveries. Three decades later, my experimental discovery of massively parallel processing enabled China to copy massively parallel processing technology and use it to massively compress their times to solution for solving the most computation-intensive mathematical problems and compress that them from 30,000 years to just one day. That was how China, that did not invent massively parallel processing, has massively parallel processed its way to the world's fastest supercomputers. For me, Philip M. Aguale, I entered into the unknown world of massively parallel supercomputing and entered at a time parallel processing was ridiculed as a huge waste of everybody's time. My turning point was on September 10, 1973, when I received a four-year scholarship to study mathematics in Oregon, United States. To put things in perspective, back in 1973, it was rare for a teenager in Igbo land to get a scholarship and get it directly from the United States. In 1973, fewer than a hundred scholarships or one in a million were given by the Nigerian government. 
That was the reason I was the only teenager at the airport in Ikeja, Nigeria in the late afternoon of Saturday, March 23, 1974. I was the fourth Nigerian to live in Monmouth, Oregon in the Pacific Northwest region of the United States. So my four-year scholarship to Monmouth, Oregon was what set me on the right path and set me on my personal quest for parallel processing, the computer, the technology that now makes computers faster and makes supercomputers fastest. Recording previously unrecorded supercomputer speeds is the only objective measure of the computer inventor's contributions to the development of the computer. Only those computer inventors that work directly with the potential fastest supercomputers can discover that parallel processing will make the computer fastest. I had to be at the right place, which was Covalis, Oregon, United States, instead of Onicha, East Central State, Nigeria. And be at that uncharted territory of human knowledge of fastest computing to contribute to the development of the fastest supercomputer. I had to be in the computer center at 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Corvallis, Oregon, at the right time or on June 20, 1974. I was doing scientific research as a teenager, both in Nigeria and the United States, as an aside, an independent scientific research that I did as a 70-year 70-year-old Philip M. Agwale of Christ the King College on Nietzsche, Nigeria was mentioned in the science column of the Daily Times newspaper of Nigeria. A 19-year-old Philip M. Agwale was on the cover of a local newspaper in Oregon, United States. On September 10, 1973, and about a year after I was mentioned in the Daily Times of Nigeria, I won a four-year scholarship to train as a mathematician in the United States. That four-year scholarship of 1973 was the beginning of my 19-year scholarship in the United States that led to my training as a polymath that is at home at the frontiers of knowledge in physics, mathematics, and computing. I won that four-year scholarship of 1973 before I applied for the scholarship and before I applied for admission into any American university. That scholarship was my breakthrough moment that made it possible for me to start programming supercomputers and programming them at a time there was no supercomputer in Africa. That scholarship letter that was dated September 10, 1973, put me at the right place at the right time. Namely, being a teenager in the 1970s, that was programming supercomputers and doing so at 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Corvallis, Oregon, United States, instead of being a teenager in July 1969 at Oguta War Front of the Nigeria Biafra Civil War. Five years before I started programming the sequential processing supercomputer, I was a 14-year-old soldier on the Biafran side of the Oguta war front. The opposing Nigerian side at the Oguta war front was commanded by Colonel Olusegun Obasanjo, 
who later rose to become the third time president of Nigeria. It's not a coincidence that many of the computer pioneers of today were teenagers in the early 1970s. It's not a coincidence that Steve Jobs and Bill Gates were born a few months apart from my birth date of August 23, 1954. Steve Jobs was also about 19 years old then and was then living in nearby Portland, Oregon, United States, not in Lagos, Nigeria, West Africa. And Bill Gates was also about 19 years old and was then living in nearby Seattle, Washington, United States, not in Nairobi, Kenya, East Africa. In the 1980s, I was the lone wolf full-time research programmer of the massively, of the most massively parallel processing supercomputer that was ever built. I was exploring the uncharted territories of supercomputing called massively parallel processing. In the 1980s, 25,000 research computational scientists were exploring the uncharted territories of computing. That unknown world was called vector processing supercomputing. The difference between those 25,000 research physicists, research mathematicians, research computer scientists, and myself was that they were replowing or researching computational physics or calculus or algebra or vector processing supercomputers. They were replowing or researching fields of study that had been plowed. They were replowing or researching supercomputers that one million computer scientists that preceded them had plowed since the automatic programmable computer was invented back in 1946. Back in the 1970s, I did not believe in replowing the field of sequential processing supercomputing that had been plowed during the preceding three decades. Nor did I believe in replowing the field of vector processing supercomputing that had been plowed since the 1960s. In general, Replowing the fields of sequential processing and vector processing supercomputers merely yields a factor of two increase in computer speed. That doubling of computer speed that occurred every two years is called Moore's Law. I paradigm shifted and plowed the field of massively parallel processing supercomputers. Doing so made the news headlines in 1989. I became known as the African supercomputer wizard in the United States. I became known for experimentally discovering a factor of 65,536 fold increase in parallel processing supercomputing speeds. I became known for inventing a new supercomputer that can compress 65,536 days or 180 years of time to solution on one processor and compress it to just one day of time to solution across the global network of 65,536 processors that defined, outlined, and powered that parallel processing supercomputer. Back in the 1970s, the leaders of thought 
in vector processing supercomputing rejected my research in parallel processing supercomputers. They rejected my theory that I could solve 65,536 problems at once and compute faster than those that solved only one problem at a time. Back in the 1980s, the leaders of thought in vector processing supercomputing gave me bad advice that did me more harm than good. The leaders of thought in vector processing supercomputing insisted that I, Philip Emma Aguale, sign a written contract on the supercomputer speed up that I will experimentally discover within vector processing. The leaders of thought in vector processing supercomputing insisted that I a priori explain how I will experimentally discover that that supercomputer speed up and most importantly experimentally discover that speed up by disavowing the parallel processing supercomputer technology that was absolutely necessary for experimentally discovering my speed up of 65,536. I wasted the decades of the 1970s and 80s fighting against the resistance and the skepticism about massively parallel processing supercomputers, that lack of support forced me to work alone and in exile from the supercomputing community. Those leaders of thought in vector processing supercomputing ridiculed parallel processing as a beautiful theory that lacked experimental confirmation. Due to those ridicules, my experimental confirmation of parallel processing was rejected in the 1980s and rejected by the vector processing supercomputing community. In that decade of the 1980s, my discovery of parallel processing was rotten in the drawers of prominent supercomputer scientists. My supercomputing quest that began on a sequential processing supercomputer and began on June 20, 1974 and began at 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Covalis, Oregon, United States was to experimentally confirm parallel processing and to confirm the, the technology by solving 65,536 problems in large-scale computational physics and solving them at once instead of solving only one smaller scale computational physics problem at a time. To compare replowing vector processing supercomputers instead of plowing parallel processing supercomputers is like comparing repairing an existing Lagos on Nietzsche Road to building a new road between Lagos, Nigeria and Johannesburg, South Africa. The supercomputer of today will become the computer of tomorrow. The massively parallel processing supercomputer that I experimentally discovered back in 1989 that was ridiculed by Steve Jobs had become the computer of today. You've changed the way you look at your computer. 
In the 1980s and earlier, you looked at your computer as powered by only one isolated processor that was not a member of an ensemble of processors. Those processors communicate and compute together and as one seamless cohesive supercomputer. Today, you look at your computer as powered by a hundred and sometimes a thousand processors. In mathematical studies that I conducted in the 1970s and in companion laboratory experiments that I conducted in the 1980s, I discovered how to use an internet that is a global network of 65,536 processors. I discovered how to use that internet to solve the toughest problems in large-scale computational physics. That discovery set me apart from Thomas Edison and his invention of the light bulb. That discovery set me apart from Alexander Graham Bell and his invention of the telephone. That discovery set me apart from Albert Einstein and his discovery of the theory of relativity. And that discovery set me apart from the heroes like George Washington Carver and heroines of science like Marie Curie that are scientific role models and that are studied in American and European schools. The reason I am the subject of school reports is that I contributed to the development of the fastest supercomputers. My contribution to the development of the computer is my experimental discovery of massively parallel processing. My contribution to the development of the computer was as objective as my speed increase of a factor of 65,536. My contribution to the development of the computer is as measurable as the fastest speed in the history of computing. My contribution to the development of the computer is as tangible as a computer and as visible as an internet. That visible internet is a global network of 65,536 processors. The reason my contributions made the news headlines in 1989 was that it changed the way we think about the supercomputer. After 1989, we think of the supercomputer not as processing only one thing at a time, but as processing many things at once. A contribution to the development of the modern supercomputer that solves many problems at once is concrete and durable because faster computations are objective and measurable. That contribution to the fastest supercomputer will stand as long as the computer exists. That contribution will stand as long as the internet or global network of computers exists. 
that contribution will perhaps stand as long as the rock of Gibraltar exists. In the 1970s, supercomputer scientists followed an erroneous line of reasoning. The leaders of thought in supercomputing pointed out that the human brain is not wired to process many things at once. For that reason, the reason that the supercomputer should not be wired to process many things at once. In the 1970s and 80s, research computational scientists only focused on ways to use scalar and vector processing supercomputers and on how to use them to solve the most computation-intensive problems. In the 1970s, I believe that the modern supercomputer should be an ensemble of the slowest processors that communicates and computes together and as one seamless, cohesive supercomputer. In the 1980s, Seymour Cray, who was then who was the then leading luminary in the world of vector processing supercomputers, argued that the supercomputer must be powered by a single vector processing unit. Seymour Cray believed in the insightful and brilliant lecture. He who tries to do many things at once will accomplish nothing." Unquote. In 1989, it made the news headlines that an African supercomputer wizard in the United States had discovered that Seymour Cray was wrong. That African that African discovered that the modern supercomputer can process many things or processes at once. I, Philip Emma Aguale, was that African supercomputer scientist. My contributions to the development of the supercomputer was recorded in the June 20, 1990 issue of the Wall Street Journal. Yet, I was not an overnight success in supercomputing. I began programming supercomputers exactly 16 years earlier and at age 19. I began programming supercomputers on June 20, 1974. I began programming supercomputers at 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Corvallis, Oregon, United States. To invent is to turn fiction to non-fiction. The reason my experimental discovery that parallel processing makes computers faster and makes supercomputers fastest made the news headlines in 1989 was that it was the biggest paradigm shift in the history of the computer. At first, my experimental discovery of massively parallel processing was dismissed as a scientific non-accomplishment and dismissed as a technological non-achievement. At first, my experimental discovery of massively parallel processing was in fact cited to discredit my intellect. Instead of discrediting my intellect, that discovery of how to solve the toughest problems in both calculus and algebra put me on the perennial list of the 10 most intelligent persons in the world. 
Back in the 1980s, when I mentioned my experimental discovery of parallel processing, everybody said I made a mistake. And my discovery was promptly rejected. My discovery of parallel processing was ruled as a scientific upside or the supercomputer programming mistake of performing something illegal in mathematical parallel processing computations. Before my experimental discovery of parallel processing in 1989, none of the then fastest supercomputers we are powered by parallel processing. After my experimental discovery of 1989, all supercomputers and most computers were powered by parallel processing technology. In the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, the list of the computer pioneer the list of the computer pioneers that ridiculed parallel processing looked like it was drawn as a roster of the who is who in the world of high performance computer technology. Gene Amdahl of Amdahl's Law of Fame of April 1967 used Amdahl's Law to ridicule parallel processing. Gene Amdahl is best known for arguing that parallel processing could not be harnessed to solve the toughest problems in large-scale computational physics. Seymour Cray of vector processing fame of the 1970s ridiculed parallel processing. Seymour Cray caricatured parallel processing with his famous chicken versus oxen quote. That quote of Seymour Cray is the most often repeated quote in supercomputing. That quote of Seymour Cray is always cited by those that opposed parallel processing. And Steve Jobs of Apple Computers of the 1970s and 80s ridiculed parallel processing and rejected the technology as a huge waste of everybody's time. In the 1980s, 25,000 computational scientists were only using vector processing supercomputers to solve their problems. Those 25,000 computational scientists constantly ridiculed parallel processing and dismissed the technology as a huge waste of everybody's time. I, Philip Emma Aguale was the lone wolf full-time programmer of the most massively parallel processing supercomputer ever built. By 1989, the digital divide in supercomputing can be summed as follows. The lone wolf full-time programmer of the precursor to the modern supercomputer was black and was born in Akure, colonial Nigeria, in the heart of colonial Africa. I was the invincible black man in the 1970s and 80s world of supercomputing who became very visible after 1989. I was the black person that was as invincible as a black box in a dark room. I was also the black supercomputer scientist that was unafraid of the darkness. I was the black lone wolf in the uncharted territory of massively parallel supercomputing. I was the lone wolf on his quest to cross the frontier of knowledge 
and to discover how and why parallel processing makes supercomputers fastest. The reason American students write school reports on Philip M. Aguale is that I experimentally discovered a new way of looking at computers and understanding how and why parallel processing makes computers faster. I experimentally discovered a new paradigm that changes how we compute and how we do so at the fastest speeds. Discovering how and why parallel processing makes the computer faster will always prompt the leaders from the world of computers and supercomputers to ask for your telephone number. In the 1980s, every vector processing supercomputer scientist that I spoke to insisted that I had made a mistake in my programming of the world's fastest supercomputer. I programmed that supercomputer not as a computer per se. I programmed that supercomputer as an internet de facto or as a global network of 65,536 processors that we are married together by another global network of 1,048,576 email wires. For that alleged mistake, no vector processing supercomputer scientist took the time to read my entire 1,057 page supercomputing research report. That negative attitude changed after the June 20, 1990 issue of the Wall Street Journal mentioned the names Philip Emma Aguale and Steve Jobs on subsequent paragraphs. So I was not surprised that Steve Jobs somehow got my telephone number. On June 20, 1990, both Steve Jobs and the Wall Street Journal did not take it for granted that I experimentally discovered how to harness the total Insightful and brilliant picture. Six identical processors that were equal distances are far and apart. That experimental discovery opened the door to the technology of parallel processing that is at the core of the modern computer and today's supercomputer. That experimental discovery opened the door to parallel processing one million or even a billion problems or processes at once. Looking back, the June 14, 1976 issue of the Computer World carried an article titled, quote, Research in Parallel Processing questioned as waste of time, unquote. Today, we take it for granted that the world's fastest supercomputer manufactured in China is fastest because it harnessed the total computing power of 10,649,600 processors. But to Steve Jobs, my experimental discovery of 1989 of how to compress 65,536 days or 180 years of time to solution and how to compress that time to solution across an internet that I described 
as my global network of 65,536 processors. And how to compress that time to solution to just one day of time to solution was like watching science fiction become non-fiction. In the 1980s, I dreamt that in a century, a school report said something to this effect. Once upon a time, 25,000 supercomputer scientists embarked on a quest for a magic supercomputer that could be faster than their fastest supercomputers that was powered by only one processor. Every two years, the school report continues. Their supercomputer only doubled in speed. Then one day, a new magician arrived from a 16-dimensional universe. That new magician experimentally discovered the 2 to power 16 computers as just one internet that is de facto one supercomputer or processor that uniformly encircled a globe in the magician's 16-dimensional ancestral universe. That new magician experimentally discovered how to increase the speed of supercomputers and increase them in theory by a factor of 2 to power 16 and increase them by a factor of 2 to power 64. That new magician opened the door to the modern supercomputer that can compress 180 years of time to solution to just one day of time to solution. That magician opened the door to the precursor to their planetary supercomputer that will enshroud the earth with its electronic plot and consciousness. That magician turned fiction to fact. Solving the grand challenge problem of supercomputing required a supercomputer that is faster than the fastest computer as well as scientific knowledge that is beyond algebra calculus and physics. Each of the 20 grand challenge problems of supercomputing was an interdisciplinary problem. For that reason, it was impossible for a scientist trained in only one field to even attempt to solve the same grand challenge problem alone. The research physicist is on a quest for new knowledge about how the universe works. The research physicist seeks to discover new laws of physics. On the other hand, the research mathematician is not interested in physically discovering the laws of physics per se. The research mathematician is interested in mathematically discovering some laws of logic and numbers. The research mathematician is interested on how to invent new equations. As a research mathematician, my contributions to mathematical knowledge include my nine partial differential equations that were the cover story of the May 1990 issue of the Siam News. The Siam News is the bi-monthly news journal that was the flagship publication of the mathematics community. The Siam News was published by the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics. 
the research supercomputer scientist is interested in new physics, new mathematics, and most importantly, on how and why parallel processing makes computers faster and makes supercomputers fastest. The research supercomputer scientist is on a quest to discover new knowledge that could push the frontier of computational mathematics such as to solve a system of coupled, nonlinear, and time-dependent partial differential equations that defines an initial boundary value problem of calculus and the most large-scale computational fluid dynamics, dynamics. Such systems of equations are called grand challenge equations because the set of floating point arithmetical operations for solving their algebraic analogs are too computation intensive to be solved across one processor or solves within only one computer. The research supercomputer scientist is on a quest to experimentally discover faster speeds in computation. The fastest supercomputers we are used to push the frontier of large-scale computational physics and to make the impossible to compute possible to compute. The fastest supercomputers we are used to accurately forecast Hurricane Katrina and to forecast it with excruciatingly detailed and coupled ocean atmosphere general circulation models. Back in 2015, Hurricane Katrina of Southern United States forced insurance companies to pay more than $40 billion in damages. Hurricane Katrina killed more people, more than 1,800 people. The fastest supercomputer is needed to execute the excruciatingly detailed model that was used to more accurately forecast Hurricane Katrina. The fastest supercomputer is needed to reduce forecasting uncertainties. The fastest supercomputer is needed to save more lives and properties and to make the world a better place and a more knowledgeable one. Because massively parallel supercomputing, transcendent physics, it could not have been discovered from within physics or by physical intuition alone. Massively parallel supercomputing was not discovered from intuition and mathematical brawn alone. Massively parallel supercomputing had to be discovered from the intuition, brawn, and horsepower that I generated across my primordial internet that I visualized as my global network of 65,000 536 processors or a global network of as many computers. I visualized my 16 network deep networked motherboards and the codes each executed as extensions of the singular motherboard that extends the blackboard and the differential and algebraic equations on it. The global network of 65,536 processors is not by itself a contribution to the development of the supercomputer. A processor is like a coffin that is merely a box until you put somebody inside it. 
However, however, the 65,536 fold increase in supercomputer speeds that compressed 65,536 days or 180 years of time to solution to just one day of time to solution and that opened the door to the compression of 30,000 years of time to solution to just one day of time to solution is a paradigm shift of tectonic scale. In theory, I discovered how to compress a time to solution that is as old as 42 times the age of the universe and compress it to just one second of time to solution across a global network of two raised to power 64 processors. I visualize those processors in 64 dimensional hyperspace. My experimental discovery of how to compress 30,000 years of time to solution to just one day of time to solution change the way we think about the supercomputer of today that will become the computer of tomorrow. That experimental discovery of how in theory to compress a time to solution of 42 times the age of the universe to a time to solution of just one second is the most important discovery in the history of the computer. A research supercomputer scientist in quest for the fastest supercomputer that parallel processed across an internet had to be a polymath as well as a mathematician and had to have the knowledge and the command of materials and the fluency of ideas that are required to deliver lectures on his contributions to scientific knowledge. The polymath's lectures must be fantastical and even make the mathematician deeply uncomfortable. The polymath must simultaneously deliver his or her series of multidisciplinary lectures and speak from the frontier of knowledge of large-scale algebra and speak from the frontier of knowledge of advanced calculus and speak from the frontier of knowledge of, of large-scale computational physics and speak from the frontier of knowledge of massively parallel processing and in particular processing the grand challenge problem of supercomputing and solving that problem across a primordial internet. My internet was a small copy of the internet that is a global network of computers. Like the internet that is a global network of computers or de facto a global network of processors my primordial internet is a global network of 16 times 2 to power 16 regular, short, and equidistant email wires that married 2 to power 16 commodity of the shelf processors together and married them as one cohesive whole unit that is not a computer per se but is a supercomputer de facto. It was a paradox to believe that I solved the toughest problem in computation and did so at the crossroads of physics, calculus, and computing and believe that I solved that grand challenge problem alone and did so without foremost arriving at the frontiers of knowledge of physics, calculus, and computing. It was a paradox 
that was fueled by jealous academics. It's only a biased person that will watch my videotaped lecture series and continue to deny that I was at the frontier of knowledge of large-scale computational physics. I put in 200,000 hours in my quest for how and why parallel processing makes computers faster and makes supercomputers fastest. It's a paradox in their understanding that I solved an interdisciplinary grand challenge problem that spanned the disciplines, disciplines of mathematics, physics, and computing, and solved that interdisciplinary problem without being at the frontiers of knowledge of those three disciplines. Put differently, it's impossible to solve the toughest problem in calculus and solve it without foremost learning how to solve the easiest problems in calculus. Faster supercomputers yield more scientific discoveries that push the frontier of computer knowledge as well as broaden our horizons. The fastest supercomputer is used to execute general circulation models that is used to foresee the worst case future of the planet we call home. The 21st century supercomputer scientist that embarked on his hero's quest for the fastest parallel processing supercomputer should be armed with two swords. That hero's quest is for the frontier of knowledge and for the uncharted territory where groundbreaking scientific discoveries can be discovered and where technological inventions can be invented. That hero's quest is for the primal place where galaxies are astronomically large. The frontier of astronomy is where the strange stars can be discovered. The frontier of astronomy is at astronomically far away distances. At the frontier of astronomy, astronomically expensive multi-billion dollar telescopes are required to discover those astronomically far away stars. One such telescope called the Square Kilometer Array or SKA for short is a network of 3,015 meter dishes with a total collecting area of one square kilometer. The square kilometer array has a price tag of $1.5 billion. The world's fastest, the world's most expensive telescope works together with the equally expensive array of processors such as the global network of 64 binary thousand processors that is married together as one seamless cohesive supercomputer and married by one binary million regular short and equidistant email wires that I experimentally discovered how to program to send and receive astronomically large data to and from 64 binary thousand processors. That hero's quest is for the primal time or the beginning of time when the Big Bang explosion occurred. That hero's quest is for the primal things or the things that are extremely small. That hero's quest is for the primal computations or the quantum computations that can occur at subatomic levels. That hero's quest is for the primal communications and computations that made the news headlines when I experimentally discovered them as the fastest computations across one binary 
million regular short and equidistant email wires that wired 64 binary thousand processors and wired them as a global network that I named a hyperball supercomputer. In our search, or rather research, for distant galaxies colonized by super intelligent beings, or for planets that exhibit evidence of extraterrestrial intelligence, that primal place is at the edge of our visible known universe. The primal place where strange galaxies can be discovered is beyond the edge of our visible universe, which is 18 billion light years. The distance of that primal place is 18 billion times the miles light travels in a year while traveling at its speed in a vacuum. That speed is always about 186,000 miles per second or exactly 299,792,458 meters per second. That hero's quest is a response to a call for adventure arising from humanity's need to foresee otherwise unforeseeable climate change. The unforeseeable global warming is sometimes seen by reducing 30,000 years of time to solution to only one day of time to solution. The first sword on that hero's quest must be intellectual and must be used to understand parallel processing. And most importantly, to go against convention and to go against the prevailing paradigm to advocate parallel processing and advocate the technology at a time parallel processing was misunderstood and dismissed by everybody as a huge waste of everybody's time. The second sword on that hero's quest must be a never-before-seen electronic instrument that will be used to see an ensemble of processors that was previously unseen as one unit and unseen as a seamless cohesive supercomputer. That second sword on that hero's quest is used to compress 10.65 million days or 30,000 years of time to solution to only one day of time to solution. That compression of time to solution was discovered across an ensemble of 10.65 million processors. The strong intellectual sword on that hero's quest is used to slash the grand challenge problems of supercomputing. That intellectual sword is used to understand the laws of physics and is used to invent the partial differential equations of calculus that encode those laws of physics. That intellectual sword is used to formulate the system of equations of large-scale algebra that approximates those partial differential equations that define the initial boundary value problem that is at the mathematical core of the most vexing grand challenge problem. That intellectual sword takes the inventor of the modern supercomputer to the frontier of knowledge and into the uncharted territory known as massively parallel processing. The physical sword, or the never-before-seen large-scale ensemble of processors, takes the, the, the discoverer inside the terra incognita or the unknown world of scientific knowledge where floating point arithmetical operations could be executed at speeds previously unrecorded. That unknown world is the primal place 
where the previously unseen is seen. That primal place is where groundbreaking discoveries are made. That primal place is a place of extremes. The physical instrument used at that primal place is often as extremely expensive as the $13.25 billion Large Hadron Collider in Geneva, Switzerland. The physical instrument used at that primal place is often as astronomically large as the most powerful telescopes. That physical instrument is used to search for infinitely small subatomic particles such as the bosom. That physical instrument is a supercomputer in progress that could be used as the prototype for my proposed cosmic supercomputer on the North Pole. But more importantly, the human instruments must be a large team of Renaissance scientists and polymaths, each a walking encyclopedia. My experimental discovery of parallel processing is permanently embodied inside your computer. Parallel processing enables us to obtain a surer and deeper understanding of our universe and in particular enables us to foresee otherwise unforeseeable climatic changes that enshroud the earth. Faster supercomputers enable us to climb higher and up the ladder of knowledge and to make the impossible to compute possible to compute. Faster supercomputers make it possible to foresee otherwise unforeseeable climate change. Faster supercomputers make it possible to develop more powerful technologies. Over the last five millennia, we progressed from the wheel to the automobile and progressed from the planting of cassava to hoping for the discovery of the cure of AIDS. Hopefully, our descendants will progress from the abacus. How, hopefully, our descendants will progress from the abacus as the computing age of 3,000 years ago to our hoped-for super-intelligent supercomputers of 3,000 years from today. I foresee our descendants of a thousand millennia to be super-intelligent lizards that are masquerading as posthumans in the planet Mars. A million is a thousand millennia away. I was asked, how will our year million post-human descendants be supercomputing? My answer is this. I don't know the answer. But I believe that the supercomputer will be the walking stick in humanity's million-year hero's journey. That spiritual journey to envision our post-human descendants will be akin to metaphorically visiting the land of the cyborgs where each cyborg is half human and half super intelligent computer. That spiritual journey to envision cyborgs will be akin to metaphorically visiting the land of the spirits of my grandma's folklore, of my ancestral Igbo land of southeastern Nigeria. I believe that by the end of our millennium, our descendants could reinvent themselves as asexual cyborgs that is half humans, half computers. Each cyborg 
with a great sense of humor. I believe that our cyborg descendants of a million will be anthropomorphic or have human attributes. I believe that our cyborg descendants of a million will be human-like because we humans will create them in our own image. I believe that our cyborg descendants will not have computers around them. I believe that the computer will be within them. I believe that our descendants will not need computers because there will be computers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Insightful and brilliant lecture.